Thanks, Russ. I like to look pretty in the pictures. You had half an eye there. <laughs> Sorry? You had half an eye. <laughs> <laughs> now get my good side. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. I remember when I was uh, interviewing for one of my previous jobs and I was talking to uh, the, pers the, the employer and he said, uh, he was a big fan of irony, but not of sarcasm. So I googled irony, because I thought, this sounds like a very significant sort of nuancing. And on Google it said, sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Google, you let me down. Um, there is, however, a difference. There is a difference. Uh, so, irony and sarcasm operate verbally in almost the same way. It's when we say one thing, but something else is meant. They both have that in common. But sarcasm is destructive, whereas irony can be used in a constructive sense. So it's the same verbal game we play, but with a very different intent. Sarcasm is destructive, irony can be constructive. It's about intent, which means it's about relationships and about understanding. Much of scripture has irony in it. And we don't always notice that. Quite often I think we don't notice that because we're in the habit of reading it in church. And the person who reads it, reads it in a very serious tone of voice because we take this very seriously. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's lost his marbles. He's gone crazy, hasn't he? One too many knocks to the head. Mary, you dropped him on the head when he was a baby. Now look at him. <laughs> now, in a certain sense, they are absolutely right, aren't they? About, I mean, if I came in and said, So, I have a particular and unique relationship with God such that not only do I talk to God, but God talks to me, and I can forgive sins in the same way God forgives sins. Somebody in the back is going to dial one, you know, you know, dial triple zero. Excuse me, officer. I think the rector's lost his marbles. He probably needs to be medicated. He certainly needs to be in the loony bin. I do not have the authority to forgive sins in the way that God does. Uh, I don't... So his family, in a sense, is right to be worried about him. And by any reasonable and normal definition, Jesus has lost his mind. And they are being loving. They're going, clearly he needs a bit of a holiday. He needs a break. They're trying to look after him. Except for the fact that they are wrong. Because this is not a reasonable and normal circumstance, is it? It's not. This is, in a sense, the uniqueness of Jesus, and they are not in a position to recognize it. And that, that's a really important thing in general. Many people knew Jesus very well. He ate meals with them, he walked beside them, he taught them, he gathered huge crowds. And they never recognized him. They never recognized and saw him. This is something I think is quite often true about God. God's presence is with us always, and yet so often we don't recognize it. The work of prayer is sharpening our minds so we can see the work of God. The teachers of the law, they come down from Jerusalem and they are saying he is possessed by Beelzebul, who I think is supposed to be one sort of, uh, of the dark spirits or something, demons, prince of demons. And by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. 
And I don't often go on and on about sort of demonic language because it kind of feels weird, you know. We're in Bundaberg in Australia. We're in a really privileged circumstance. There is so much that we have that we want for nothing. Well, we certainly need nothing in terms of our daily living. We've got bread and sometimes too much of it. But I want to look at this idea. What does it mean to look at Jesus and think that there is something demonic about it? In the kind of the traditional picture of what are or who are demons, they are the spirits that fell. They are the those that were good and have become impure. And then people understand them as being sort of all constantly engaged in trying to corrupt the earth and all the rest of it. And uh, and I think of the, the line, you know, lead us not into temptation, Lord, from the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we're very good at finding our own way. Um, and all too often, we don't need any outside influences to lead us astray. And so, I was wondering about the irony in this statement. Is there some way in which the teachers of the law are right? In the same way as Jesus' family are right. They are right. Any normal person doing these things is loopy, Jesus' family. Except. And is it because we are so comfortable? Is it because the teachers of the law are so comfortable with the status quo, the position that they find themselves in? the position of power and authority and religious reverence, that anything that threatens that must be, in their eyes, interpreted as evil. We all do it. When something threatens us, we have to mark the other as being dark, wrong, evil. If you've ever been in a fight or in an argument, if you've ever been you know, uh, engaged in these things, you can't help yourself but to see the other person as being fundamentally wrong. You just can't. You can't help yourself. Uh, you may have had an argument with a, a spouse, a colleague, a co-worker, uh, and you can't help yourself. They are wrong. Fundamentally wrong, because you are right. And they can't see the rightness in your position. And so the teachers of the law, they have to see Jesus as being aligned with darkness because what he is teaching is different from what they are teaching in a way that threatens their very nature. And so they have to say that is dark. But they are wrong. As well, of course, of course, because the problem for them is that they have gotten comfortable with the darkness, and so the light hurts their eyes. The light is that which is now frightening to them. Irony is important and can lead us into truth. And then Jesus tries to help them. And he does a thing which um, I'm told uh, is called indirect communication. So um, when someone's in a bad mood, one of the least helpful things you can do is something I've been known to do quite often. Are you in a bad mood? What's gone wrong? No, that's just the wrong attitude to have. I don't know if anyone's ever done that to you. When it's happened to me, the first thing that happens is that I get even crankier. <laughs> I mean, I, I know, I try very hard not to, but I, I, inside me there's a lot of cranky. And uh, <laughs> I try very hard not to let it out. 
Sermons are sometimes just group therapy. Um, <laughs> it's a really unhelpful thing to do in a practical sense. And, and sometimes the best thing to do is to, to tell a story that helps a person recognize that perhaps their perspective on life is perhaps wrong. And if you, if you can start to recognize that perhaps you are wrong, then you can start to uh, take a moment to go, well, maybe the other person has a grain of a point. Just a, just a teeny tiny. Anyway. So he tries to guide them to a place where uh, they might be more discomforted with the dark and more comfortable with the light. Where, they start, where he starts to challenge the notion of saying, if we disagree, you must be fundamentally wrong. There must be something wrong within your very nature and character. And for the church, that's a really important thing. Because we often, in sort of the broad Christian family, we want to throw stones at the people who aren't like us. They are wrong, we are right. Unity in things that are important, diversity in things that aren't, is, is the idea that we often bring to, that, say, that helps us perhaps think about these things in a slightly different perspective. And now Jesus' family comes back into the story, and they, they, there's a crowd of people, so even though he's loopy and the teachers of the Lord don't like him, there's still a bunch of people there listening. And they send someone in to go and fetch Jesus, and this person kind of makes his way through the crowd, and says, Jesus, your mum's outside, she wants to talk to you. I imagine if <laughs> someone comes and goes, Andrew, your mother's outside, she wants to have a talk with you. I'm going to feel a certain level of anxiety. No, no. Uh, maybe you grow out of that one day. Maybe not. And Jesus' response is, is interesting. And it's a response that so many people in the world need to hear. And I, there's, a, there's a quote that's attributed to various different people. Uh, Mother Teresa is one of them. That the greatest malady facing this age is loneliness. That the greatest problem facing this generation is isolation and loneliness. And when I lived on the Gold Coast, uh, one of the local councillors would often quote that same idea. And I've heard it used here in Bundaberg as well. So here's the thing. Loneliness comes because we don't feel connected to people in a significant way. And in a sense, we're all alone all the time. But even in our loneliness, there is connection. And Jesus says to the crowd, You here are my family. Those who respond to God and to the call of God are my family family. And even though each of us takes a different, independent, unique journey in our response to God, as we respond to God, we are family. And so, the church in today's time and age is the treatment for the malady of loneliness. If we can just open our eyes and our hearts to respond to God, we might also reach out our hands to those in need. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.